Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. Today's garbage is Max Magician and the Legend of the Rings, a fantasy movie for children that's very obviously capitalizing on the success of Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings. It even says so right on the DVD case. No, this is not an asylum movie. If it were, there would be a big CGI piranha or something. Instead, what we've got here is a dumb movie about a kid who goes through a magic door to a fantasy land populated by magical creatures and talking animals, like in Narnia. Now, this movie came out in 2002, before the Disney Narnia movies existed, but I'm sure they knew Disney was working on them, because every big studio back then wanted their own epic fantasy franchise based on a popular series of novels after the success of The Lord of the Rings. That's how we ended up with shit like Aragon. Max Magician is just the bottom of the barrel of that particular trend, but Sterling Entertainment Group or whatever didn't have the rights to any popular novels, so they just took elements from a bunch of different ones and made up their own thing, and then filmed it on a budget smaller than Ron DeSantis. You know the Eye of Argon is in the public domain, right? You could have made a movie based on that. Alright, that's enough intro. On to the review. The movie starts with stock footage of a forest, so that we see these two elf dudes running from this goblin guy with an axe. He's called the Red Cap, which is an actual thing from British folklore. And unlike American Red Caps, instead of voting to make Narnia great again, he throws an axe at this guy who does a stock scream sound. <laughs> then the other guy runs back to grab the scroll, but then the Red Cap throws a chain flail at him, and he makes the same stock scream sound. <laughs> Maybe that's just how elves scream. I wouldn't know. I've only ever killed Smurfs. The elf guy reaches this door thing, but then the red cap pulls his axe out of the other guy who can see it's covered in blood, and they made the blood green so it wouldn't offend the ratings board this unrated movie was never shown to. We cut to the human world where the scroll magically materializes in front of some old guy, and some princess exposits the entire backstory through voiceover. We are in grave danger. It is with great urgency that our kingdom requests aid during these troubling times. She says something about a prophecy that some savior will save them from an evil nation called the Unseelie Kingdom, which is led by a bad guy named Lord Dagda who's trying to conquer them. This princess then tells the old guy he's their only hope. Help us in our quest for the savior. You're our only hope. Like in yet another movie this one's ripping off. Just then, the old guy hears someone watching Ah Real Monsters in the distance. We dissolve to some ugly suburban home, where some ugly suburban kid screws around with his magic tricks in a mirror. For the final trick of the evening, Max Majek will make this normal playing card disappear. This is our protagonist, Max Majek. If his introduction didn't make it obvious, he wants to be a magician because this movie was made in 2002 and kids back then had aspirations beyond being Twitch streamers and OnlyFans models. His MILF caused him to go to school and he Bidens his way down the stairs. They rush to the minivan and we clock wipe to school, but I guess it's the end of the school day because the bell rings and we see Max walking home, because even though his mom drove him there, he has to walk back. I guess because she's too busy clipping bad dragon coupons to be a responsible parent. Max runs into the producer's kids, and one of them demands to see a magic trick. No, Max! You promised! Please? Wow! What an annoying voice! Max pulls out an egg, but then the two obligatory bully characters show up. Now I'm gonna put in my magic bag, and say the magic words, or... The lead bully, Bobby, volunteers for Max's trick, so Max gets the girl to smash the egg on his head. You are so dead. Really? You could take the time to get the kids to do three takes of this, but you couldn't record the sound of the girls laughing, so you had to use the same stock sound effect twice? Yeah, they actually had behind-the-scenes footage on the DVD. I was surprised to find out they actually shot this on film. It looks like it was shot on a Panasonic PD-150 or something. Get him! Yes, that's actually the sound effect they used. I like how it's not even synced up with his feet. As Max runs away, the girls crack open the trick egg and find something inside it, but I can't tell what it is. I listen to the commentary from the director who sounds like Linkara, and it turns out it's full of candy and necklaces, 
but they didn't get a close-up because the budget was so small that they didn't have a video assist, and the director didn't know neither of his two camera operators were getting a close-up. So I, I uh, in the edit, I, I couldn't cut into a close-ups that I was uh, anticipating, but... Max runs all the way to... Hey, Possum. Wanna see a magic trick? Huh? What? You wanna see a magic trick? Uh... Sure. Okay. Don't blink. Copperfield did it better. Max runs all the way to the old guy from earlier, and I guess the two bullies are afraid of him for some reason, because they just kind of f**k off. The old guy offers Max a drink, and it becomes apparent they know each other. Hey, Mr. Tim, do you know karate or something? I need to kick his teeth in. Violence isn't always the answer, son. Oh, so violence isn't always the answer, which is to imply there are times when it is the answer, like right now. Mr. Tim brings Max to his creepy shed and spells out the movie's theme and the obvious thing Max will have to predictably learn to complete his character arc. Strength comes from within. Never judge a book by its cover. So judging by the cover of that book he's holding, it must be some sort of book of magic. Mr. Tim says it's been used by wizards for centuries. I ain't talking about the kind of wizards the Democrats had after the Civil War, but the slightly more racist kind J.K. Rowling wrote about. To practice real magic, the good kind, you must always keep a pure heart. And to practice the bad kind, you need pure blood. Magic isn't real, is it? If you believe in yourself, anything is possible. We're just hitting all the cliché kids movie morals, aren't we? Mr. Tim gives Max the book, and Max asks him how he got it, but Mr. Tim decides to be mysterious. So, does this guy remind you of anyone? A certain other old man character who gives a kid a magic book immediately after he's chased down the street by bullies? He's Mr. Coriander from The NeverEnding Story, so that's another thing to ripping off. Anyway, Max f***s off with the book and goes to the forest to give treats to the local woodland critters instead of doing drugs like a normal kid his age. He sits down to read the book and finds a mouse which he proceeds to pick up and put on his shoulder. Yeah, that's a great lesson for all the kids who didn't watch this. Just pick up a wild disease-ridden rodent and put it right next to your face. So Max reads the book and finds a spell that opens a doorway to the other kingdom and decides to try it. He reads it, and a PNG of a Keebler tree with a Nightmare Before Christmas door magically appears, which I suppose is the best possible outcome. For all he knew, that spell could have opened a portal to hell, and then this movie would have gotten a lot funnier. We cut to the inside of the door to show Max walking through it because showing him physically interacting with the tree would have required them to build a prop, and he immediately trips, and then he hears someone laughing at him. So the f***ing mouse talks. Do you mind? And yes, I'm a boy! The mouse tells Max his name is Crimble, and that they're in the Blue Bell Forest. Unfortunately, there's no ice cream here, but what they do have are plenty of generic fantasy elements, like elves, a guy with a sword, bad special effects, and so on. They also had three different mice for the movie, one of which killed itself on a hamster wheel, and another of which ate the babies of the other. So we ended up with this mouse here, which we nicknamed Fat Bastard because uh, she ate the babies of our other star mouse. Crimble tells Max to follow him, but then Max sees a hawk which I thought was stock footage at first, but it apparently belonged to the writer of the movie. Crimble says the hawk's name is Shira, and she's owned by some a**hole named Fayoun. Crimble runs off and Max follows him to a tourist attraction dressed up to look like a movie set. He bangs on the door and gets grabbed by some weirdo who sounds like he was dubbed over by a woman, but I later found out he wasn't. Ah, a weary traveler I do see. A weary traveler sent to me. And he talks in rhyme because that's whimsical. So this pervert introduces himself as Tom Tit Tot, but I don't want to keep writing the words tit and tot next to each other in my script, so I'm just gonna call him Wrinkly Willy. For no particular reason, Max says he's studying magic. Rhymes with magician. Circumcision. Wrinkly Willie pulls him in, then some sketchy hooded figure watching from the bushes runs off and goes to some spooky ruin or something. He enters a door which brings him to a cave for some reason, and we're introduced to our main villain, Lord Dagda, the king of the bad guys. He just lives in a cave, I guess. I mean, it's mentioned later that his people live underground, but that doesn't mean it has to be a literal cave. 
You can dress it up a little, make it fancy, like the kind of place an underground king would live. I don't know, maybe it was cheap to film there. We have one of the few caves that's actually known to be haunted. Anyway, the hooded guy, a troll who's just named Worm, tells them he believes the Bluebell people summoned an ally, but Lord Dagda gets mad because Worm doesn't know Max's name. Then why do you interrupt me? Well, my lord, you... I've never seen you actually do any real work! Dagda calls for some guy named Fetch, makes him kiss the ring he's not wearing, and tells him and Worm to go find out if Max is the Bluebell's champion or whatever. I will find out all that is needed. Then the movie decides Dagda doesn't need to be here anymore, so he f***s off. Now I'm off to do... <laughs> King things! I did not add that sound effect. I guess the filmmakers just want us to be conscious of the fact that Dagda has an ass. I also have an asshole. So Dagda f***s off, and then we cut to Max being led by Wrinkly Willie to some kind of dining hall. Max protests, saying he needs to get home, and asks this f***ed up woman where Crimble is, but she doesn't know. Then the local princess stands up and introduces herself to Max. Welcome, Max Magician. I am Attain, Princess of the Bluebell Forest. Then some guy tells the Princess of the Blue Balls to tell Max to find some magic ring. Then tell Mr. Magician to find us the ring. Max introduces himself, then Crimble comes crawling up on the table, and then a bunch of dudes with hammers suddenly come bursting in. I like how one of them is just holding a croquet mallet. The same two sound effects get used a few times. It's that over. Then the princess tells Max to come back to them. Max smacks a guy in the face with the book. Violence isn't always the answer, son. Then the movie just cuts to him outside, having escaped somehow. They didn't show it because that would have required them to film it. He pulls Crimble out of his pocket. I just puked all over your pocket. Mice can't puke! Max says he has to go home, and Crimble doesn't seem at all concerned about the fact that his home was just invaded by armed thugs. Listen, I am so late. I gotta get home. Any good snacks there? So Max shoves Crimble back into the pocket that he said he just puked in, and then he runs back home. He tells his mom he, that he was at a friend's house, and then he goes to his room where he irresponsibly throws himself violently onto the bed while he has a small, delicate animal in his pocket. He then finds the princess's pearl necklace in his other pocket, because she just shoved it in there for some reason. And then they do a flashback because she did it so quickly and casually that everyone at the test screening didn't notice it. And then he reads from the book again. Max's mom gets a phone call from Mr. Tim while Max fills his room with magic sparkles and realizes he doesn't know how to get rid of them as his mom approaches, but he figures it out just in time. <laughs> Way too Max, you okay? Oh no! I should point out that in every scene Crimble has been in so far, he's just been laughing constantly, as if his voice being pitched up wasn't annoying enough. Max gets into bed with Crimble, but then his mom sees him and screams, so his dad comes running in. Max's parents apparently can't hear Crimble's voice and laughter because they're beyond the range of adult hearing. So Max asks his dad if he can keep him, and I guess his dad is just fine with him keeping a disease-carrying wild animal in their house, as long as he keeps him in a cage. As long as you keep it in a cage, it's fine with me. He doesn't even tell him to wash his hands. But I guess things like that tend to slip your mind when it's weighed down by the guilt of what you did during the war. The next morning, Max shows his dad a magic trick in which he makes a cup levitate while he pours milk. And then his mom tells him Mr. Tim called and said something about Max helping clean up at the uh, park today. Max's dad, played by a guy who has uncredited roles in House of Cards and Argo, tells him the other kids will laugh at him because he deserves to be laughed at. I know Crimble's your friend and all that, but don't you think the kids are going to pick on you more if they think you talk to him? But dad, I do talk to him. Then he and Crimble go to the park and see the magic door's still there. Mr. Tim shows up and congratulates Max for knowing how to read. Crimble says Mr. Tim used to be the best wizard in the world or something. Then Max and Crimble go through the door and back into the Bluebell Forest, where the hawk shows up and tells Crimble that Max isn't ready. And then some wizard-looking mother appears. It turns out this is Fayoon, the guy Crimble mentioned earlier. He tells Max he's about to embark on a journey, then he makes Max show him the spells he learned, and we get a montage of Fayoon teaching Max the new spells. But it turns out that guy Worm is spying on them. Hey, 
What an old man does with a ten-year-old boy when they're alone in the woods is their own business. You know, I just noticed the wizard's blood and brain chunks spelled out a list of names on my ceiling. Basotone, Alex Bones, Alfonso Lopez, Acolyte, Brick, Richard 699, Cortez, Scientist, Dean Brown, Delcar, Diablo Venator, Diesel Weasel, Duke Snuggles, Dumplin the Goose, Eduardo Sanchez, Enrique Vitari, Eric Hess, Ethan DeBarbarus, Franco Soraya, Goatfo, Goma Flame, Gothic Trash, G Pizzy, Happy Birthday Tate, Hey Ren and Penna, Humble Clown, Ivan Terrazas, JP, J Lee, John Wan, Joe Burr, John Cleaver, Josh Lightheart, Kano 1000, Levi Jogs, Lee, Liftick, Lyle Berniger, Marco McFire, Marcus Aurelius, Matus Polizek, Max Millie, Mitch S, Nando Pants, Nathaniel Davis, Noble Team 33, Paco, Pump Tuck, Robert Bishop, Raffle Coffer, Salty Bucket, Sam, Sir Badass, Smuggle, Thomas Brown, Tiger and Luke, Tony Belmonte, Toxic Masculinity, Twilight City Studios YouTube channel, Blue Bar Super Mug, Walker, and Zenith. I wonder who all those assholes are. We are all who trolls the wizard traps. Huh? Who said that? Down here! Oh, the, the wizard staff has a bunch of souls trapped in it, I guess. Free us from our prison, and we'll be trapped! Quiet, I'm making a video. Worm runs back to Lord Dagda and finds him asking Fetch why his men haven't found Max yet. Fetch tells him his men were distracted by looting the castle thing they attacked earlier, and Lord Dagda is okay with this for some reason. Coveting greed. This could be good. <laughs> I like it. If you watch this movie, you might notice that all of the dialogue in these cave scenes was ADR'd, because it's impossible to get good audio inside a cave, which is why most movies that feature caves don't use real ones. Worm walks up and tells Dagda he found Max with Fayun, and Dagda accuses him of lying because Fayun is supposed to be dead. Then he suddenly decides finding Max isn't important anymore. Shall I follow the boy? He is of little consequence. So even though Dagda was really insistent on fetching Worm finding Max earlier, I guess he's decided to put that on the back burner because now they have to get these magic stones and sacred rings. We cut back to Max sleeping on the ground with the poison ivy. This is uh, the poison ivy I got from laying down in the uh, forest when I was calling for Fayune and Crimble. He wakes up and realizes Crimble and Fayune are gone. He starts wandering around and hears a commotion in the distance, then stumbles upon a bunch of assholes in bad Renaissance Fair costumes hitting each other with sticks and foam hammers. <laughs> See, they're all using blunt weapons because you can't show someone getting stabbed in a kid's movie. Oh, wait. The hawk shows up again and tells Max to remember his training. Max, remember your training! And Max starts flipping through the book and finds a spell to levitate a bunch of sticks to bring them to the fighting elf people. Then he summons purple fog to blind the bad guys, but I guess it doesn't affect the elves, so the bad guys run away, but then Max gets hit in the face with a hammer. <laughs> Max wakes up with the princess looming over him like she was just waiting for him to wake up. And he's just laying there in the grass, like they couldn't be bothered to take him back to the village or a field hospital or something. And he's, he's not injured or anything. I mean, his face should look like that guy in the movie Irreversible, but he doesn't even have a concussion. It's like, yeah, his face just got caved in by a big hammer, but just put a bandage on his head, he'll be fine. In fact, he can take it off as soon as he wakes up. The princess says they won the battle and explains that any time a forest is destroyed, it makes elves die. This isn't important. In fact, it never comes up again, so I don't know why it was even mentioned. But what is important is that our kingdom and the bad guys, the Unseelie Kingdom, used to peacefully trade with each other until Lord Dagda took the throne. And then we get a flashback. Look, they actually got a horse for this movie. Hello, Dagda. What brings you into the sunshine? You, my lady. And might I say, you're as fair as a blossom you pluck. <laughs> so Horn Guy is horny for the Elf Queen, who confusingly looks exactly like Max's mom, but is, in fact, played by a different actress, a woman named Jack. Unfortunately, Dagda is not Chad enough for her, so since he can't get his rocks off, he asks for his kingdom's magic rocks back. Of course she refuses. He pretends to not be angry and asks her to give him some flowers, so she bends over and he donkey punches her into the freshly cut grass, then steals her class ring. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess Dagda kidnaps the Queen, then this fat guy who is in Spider-Man Homecoming tells him the ruler of the elves, King Hurla, is coming and he's pissed. Dagda explains he kidnaps the Queen because the women in his kingdom are ugly. No, really. This is what women look like in my realm. <sighs> Couldn't blame an honorable man for a weak moment, hmm? King Hurla demands the return of the Queen, 
So Dagda tells Worm to cut the thin strips of leather they use to tie up the queen, which I guess causes her to wake up. The princess then explains that the king and queen left without realizing Dagda still had the queen's sacred ring, and when they asked for it back, he just demanded to give him the rest of the sacred rings, because everyone in the royal family has one. My brother's is for shape-shifting and magic, and my father's provides protection and strength. There are other magic stones, too. Max asks where the queen is, then we got another flashback to when Fetch brought a cigar box with some plastic jewels glued to it to the king and queen under the false pretense of returning the ring, but it turns out it was full of wacky gas, which put the queen in an eternal sleep and turns everyone else in the room into animals. Except for Fetch, of course. The princess goes on to explain that Dagda wanted the wacky gas to affect the whole town, but it didn't. So he got pissed and killed his only sorcerer, and now there's no one who can reverse the spell. I mean, Fayoon is still around, but I guess he doesn't count. Max realizes his book is missing, then we cut to Wrinkly Willy f***ing around with it. Back in the cave, Dagda yells at Fetch for his men being defeated in battle, and they realize Max is, in fact, of consequence. You said he was a real consequence. I said that. Dagda tells Fetch to summon the Red Cap and Worm to draw a picture of Max so the Red Cap will know what he looks like, but Worm doesn't want to help kill Max. He looks like such a nice boy. I mean, that don't... <sighs> Max and the Princess find Wrinkly Willy stuck spinning because of a spell. Max breaks the spell, so Wrinkly Willy promises to serve him forever. In the cave again, the Red Cap looks at a drawing of Max, and then we cut back to Max and the Princess. Max tries to find a spell to give the elves weapons better than sticks, but the princess explains that they don't want to kill anyone. We don't fight to destroy things. We fight in self-defense. Besides, have you seen what a stick can do? Have you seen what a 556 can do to the head of a hammer-wielding barbarian? You're lucky Dagda is so stupid or this self-righteous pacifist bull they would have gotten you killed already. Fetch walks up to Dagda, who's just hanging out in the woods, I guess because they forgot to film this scene while they still had access to the cave. And Dagda says once they conquer the Bluebell people, they'll go to the human world to conquer them too. Fetch tells him that's probably a bad idea, not because humans have guns, but because his army isn't ready for all this conquest. Your, uh, army is not prepared for all these conquests, my lord. You realize that? Dagda tells Fetch to f*** off. And then we cut to the princess showing Max how to fight with a stick. This method is not meant to kill. Very few Bluebell warriors have killed. It simply stops and drops the enemy. Because no one has ever been killed by blood force trauma, right? So the princess demonstrates by hitting Wrinkly Willy, and then tells Max to hit him too, but Wrinkly Willy awkwardly dodges it. <laughs> <You missed. laughs> the princess hits him again, then tells Max to try again. Wrinkly Willy dodges it once more, but then Max uses some kind of enchantment and ruptures Wrinkly Willy's appendix. <laughs> that's how Houdini died. So I guess the message of this movie is that's wrong to solve your problems with violence, but it's okay to beat the shit out of your friends with a stick. You know, as practice for solving your problems with violence. And be sure to laugh and high five when they fall over in pain. We cut to the Red Cap looking for Max. Here's a fun fact. The Red Cap was played by the writer's landlord. And this is the shot where an elf is being hunted by the Red Cap, none other than my landlord of my office building. Then we see Max and Crimble hanging out when Crimble smells someone approaching. Who are you? So after Max viciously assaults the guy before he even knows who he is, Worm tells Max that Dagda sent the Red Cap to kill him. So he sent the Red Cap after you? So like, what am I supposed to do? Uh oh. Max, look out! I can't show this whole scene because it would set off YouTube's content ID bots, but if I could, you would see that this scene perfectly encapsulates how hilariously awkward the editing is. Every time a character speaks, there's a cut and a weirdly long pause before the other character speaks. You just have to watch it yourself. Anyway, Max fights and defeats the Red Cap with such ease that it completely deflates the buildup this character was given. Then Max brings Worm to the Bluebell Castle, which I'm not sure even has a name. But Wrinkly Willy sees Worm and attacks. Everyone else runs outside for some reason, then Max breaks up the fight. 
The princess shows up and tells Worm to f**k off, so he f**ks off. Max asks the princess why she did that, and the princess says it's because she's racist. Now why'd you go and do that? He's my friend! Because of your friend's people. The princess goes on to explain that Dagda has united the tribes of the Unseelie Kingdom or whatever, and now he has a huge army coming for them, and she gets mad at Max for bringing Worm there and calls him a fool. Then Max gets mad at her and f**ks off. So Max wanders around the woods and runs into the hawk who tells him to forgive the princess, but Max says he couldn't help anyway because he sucks at everything. But then the hawk tells him he can use his magic to awaken these guys called the Sleeping Warriors. So he reads the spell in the book, and then starts shaking it and pretending it's vibrating with magic or something. Then we cut to Fetch running back to Dagda who's still just standing there in the woods. Every time someone goes up to Dagda to tell him something, he's either just standing or sitting. You could have him reading a book or strangling his worm or something. You know, make it look like he's having a life before the camera got there. But that's the sort of decision a director would make, and this movie didn't have one. It's the red cap. He has failed. What? The lighting changes between cuts as Dagda growls twice in frustration. <sighs> He tells Fetch to prepare his horse, and then we cut back to Max being led by the book to some nondescript spot in the woods. He drops it in the leaves, and this is apparently where the sleeping warriors are buried. He reads from the book and, like, four dudes start rising up from the leaves. Whoa. Awesome. I just want to point out that there exist at least two versions of this movie with slight differences. In the DVD version, this scene has a terrible sparkle effect, but whatever version they have on Amazon Prime has a terrible lightning effect instead. A lot of the special effects are changed, like when the tree appears, the graphic doesn't go all the way to the top of the screen in the DVD version, but they fixed it in the Amazon version. The color grading and sound mixing are also a little different. This implies that someone actually took the time to go back and change things in this movie at some point, like some sort of George Lucas-esque special edition. They didn't fix the editing, though, and they even added some mistakes, like this weird digital tape glitch. Anyway, we get a scene of Dagda riding around the woods for no reason, then we cut to Fetch giving a motivational speech to his warriors. Despite your obvious level of intelligence, you are the most powerful warriors in this forest. The two armies rush at each other because the Bluebell Warriors decide not to stay inside their fortified defensive structure, which was presumably built specifically to defend themselves from besieging armies. Then we cut back to the sleeping warriors rising up from the leaves when Dagda suddenly walks up behind Max and smacks him in the head. I guess he just knew where to find him somehow, and managed to walk up behind him without him hearing him stomping around on the leaves. Max uses magic to make a tree branch smack Dagda. We cut back to the battle and watch some oaf get kicked by literal children. Then we see Max finish summoning the sleeping warriors who clumsily stand up and start walking. Keep going, keep going. Looks great, guys. Looks great. Keep going. Then they're suddenly at the battlefield like this was happening 20 feet away or something. But what matters is the sleeping warriors have arrived to save the kingdom in an epic moment of triumph, like the Rohirrim charging over the hill at the Pelennor Fields. So the sleeping warriors beat the shit out of everyone. Violence isn't always the answer, son. Then Dagda wakes up and starts strangling Max. But then Krimble jumps on Dagda, causing him to fall to the ground, pretending something's biting his neck. But then he pretends to throw Krimble and we hear him splat against the tree. Then it takes Dagda so long to get up that Max has time to read another spell. Now, this is magic we're talking about, so theoretically, Max can summon anything to fight Dagda. Bears, tigers, dinosaurs, a big spider, a goose. But he decides to go with mice. Mice which laugh like children for some reason. <laughs> Jesus Christ, how horrifying. A puff of green smoke appears and Dagda disappears, leaving his clothes behind. My brother got his f***ing Nicktoons pajama pants stolen from his apartment's laundromat because he left them behind. And then he saw the guy wearing them a few days later and did nothing about it. Then Max finds Krimble dead, and the movie tries to have an emotional moment. All of this magic, all these spells, and I can't even save you, my best friend. Now I can't verify this, but according to IMDB, 
one of the two mice who portrayed Crimble got eaten by a snake during production. Anyway, Max says he wishes he could bring Crimble back to life. Then the sleeping warriors just walk away from the battlefield, leaving all these guys behind. Are they dead? Princess What's-Her-Name said they're opposed to killing, so are these guys just knocked out? What's to stop them from attacking again when they wake up? The movie decides those aren't questions worth answering, much like the question of why the goblin turned on the stove. So Max runs into Fayoun, who berates him for not keeping some promise which I don't remember him making. It was a book doing the magic, not me. Mm, you think so? Then Max f***s off. Back in the human world, Max runs into the bullies again. Mama's boy's been crying. Hey, I'd back off if I were you. He can cast a mean old spell. It turns out that this is Crimble, having been restored back to his elf form. It turns out when Max wished him back to life, he actually cast a spell that brought him back to life. So he really does have magic powers and it wasn't just the book. Crimble puts a mouse on the bully's shoulder, causing him to freak out and run away. If you're Crimble, then who's that? So I guess Max accidentally turns Dagda into a mouse. Max goes back to the Renaissance Fair, and the Queen gives Max a sacred ring which will make him able to cross between his world and theirs, even though he can already do that. <laughs> Sometime later, Max wakes up in his bedroom and realizes he's late for school. He opens his closet and finds Worm, Wrinkly Willy, and Crimble, who presumably spent all night in there playing with their Worm, Wrinkly Willy, and Crimballs respectively. And this music, which sounds suspiciously similar to the Beetlejuice theme, plays in the background. <laughs> You guys just stay here. I have to go to school and, and be quiet. All of the music in this movie is royalty-free production music, by the way. Like the kind I use in my YouTube videos. Max runs downstairs and his mom asks him how Crimble likes his cage, unaware that Max has a new mouse now. This isn't over! Oh, oh, oh. oh I hate this wheel! Get me out of this wheel! Oh, I don't like to be in this little glass box! So I guess Max is just keeping Dagda in a cage in his room. Like, he's not bothered knowing this guy is just watching him all the time now. Anyway, the movie's over. So that's Max Magician and the Legend of the Rings. What the- Thanks for watching my video, but now you gotta leave a comment for the algorithm and like and subscribe and check my channel for other videos you may have missed and support me on Patreon to submit your fan art. Bye.